magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldElder.com. I'm Brent, and in this video, I'm going to be introducing the basics of how Eldari play on the table in 10th edition Warhammer 40k, as well as providing some advice about list building so that you newer players don't spend $500 on models only to discover that your army is about as effective as a comforting aphorism on the side of a soccer mom's canvas grocery bag. Before I start, though, uh, I'm going to add a disclaimer, and that is... If you're only going to play with your friend Bernard, who gets a game in once every four months and barely knows the rules, or the affable neighborhood neckbeard, who's been running the same Space Marine list since 8th edition, then a lot of the advice I give might not be necessary in order for you to succeed. Like any hobby, the goal of 40k is to enjoy yourself, and if you and your opponents are having fun, you're doing it right. Uh... That said, one way to have fun playing 40k, as with many tabletop strategy games, is to treat it as a tactical contest in which a big part of the enjoyment comes from trying to outbuild, outmaneuver, and outthink one another at the table, which can involve a steep learning curve initially if you are playing with people who are ready and able to play that kind of 40k. So if instead of playing with your two friends who play about as much as you do, you're playing at a local game store or maybe even going to some small tournaments or just playing with a wide, wider community. That can be challenging. So the goal of this video is to help anyone trying to get a handle on Aldari for either casual or competitive play to shorten that learning curve and to also, frankly, avoid spending money that you might later find yourselves wishing that you had spent differently. So to that end, in the second part of the video, which is the longer part, uh, I'm going to suggest that new players gravitate towards certain units and combos while avoiding others. And the suggestions that I make will be informed not only by my own play experience, but years of reviewing pretty much every Eldari list to finish in the top three of a grand tournament in the U.S. or Europe. So I'm, I'm not just like making this up. Uh, and obviously you should feel free to disregard me entirely and do whatever you want. I am not the boss of you. This hobby is about having fun, right? And there's nothing wrong with buying units just because you think that they look cool. I, I own every unit in the codex and I spend tons of time painting stuff that has no competitive viability at all. And I run it in casual plays, get games, excuse me. But even in casual play, it does help to have some notion of which units will be the ones that do real work for you and which you are bringing primarily for narrative or aesthetic reasons, right? You, to be able to make that distinction helps you build a more informed list. Also, every single unit in 40K can be effective under the right circumstances, especially with really good dice rolls. So even if a unit is wildly overcosted for what it does compared to some other cheaper unit that is objectively more effective at the job, that first unit can still be a star performer in the right casual game. So please don't feel you need to like tell me off in the comments because this one time your Hemlock Wraith Fighter really tore Bernard a new one. Uh, I I like playing I like playing with all the units in the Codex except the Webway Gate. It's it, it's ridiculously priced, but but everything else I've run in lists and, and it's all a lot of fun. Uh, so this is not a I'm I'm not telling you the only things that you should use. You should use whatever units you in, in, enjoy using. Nevertheless, here we go. All right, so we're going to start with big picture Eldari strategy. What is What does playing Eldari look like tactically in 10th edition? As in many editions of the game in the 10th incarnation of Warhammer 40k, space elves are what we sometimes refer to as a toolbox army, which means they have a wide variety of highly specialized units such that they have a tool for every problem they may encounter. And success typically depends on assigning the best tools to the right tasks and knowing how to most effectively buff particular units with stratagems or overlapping unit card abilities such that those units become wildly effective. If we were to generalize, we would say that Eldari are fast, fragile, and hard-hitting. Overall, this is true. But being a toolbox army with over 63 units in their uh, index, which is crazy. It's a great deal. Uh, there are several also highly durable units to choose from. You could build a highly durable Eldari list. It's it's doable. So there, there are kind of a wide variety of uh, types of build that are available to you. Nevertheless, 
if there is a standard strategy for space elves, and, and there, there sort of is, and there are a lot of types of lists that are available to you within this lens, so it's not like there's one list you have to run, but the, the general strategy, the general approach is this. Uh, your units keep their heads down until you have whittled away at your opponent's fastest and most dangerous units, even if it means falling behind on victory points in the first two or even three turns of the game. And then once enough of your opponent's essential units have been removed, your space elves get really aggressive uh, with with scoring for a come from behind victory in the last two turns. So in the early part of the game, first couple of turns, you prioritize killing your opponent's essential stuff and you score just enough that uh, you can still pretty much max out your score at the end of the game. And, and then once your opponent, once you have more tools than your opponent does and the, your, your opponent's tools that will be best at destroying your essential units are gone, then you get really aggressive. That's the overall strategy. The single worst thing you can do as a new Eldari player is to rush onto midfield objectives turn one with fragile infantry, bikes, and only modestly durable grav tanks. Uh, and sometimes this happens, right? Like new players, they start playing the game and initially they're like, this is a game about destroying your opponent's army and then they don't score enough points and they lose and then they're like, ah, objectives. And, and the level two is like, well, I'd better jump on those objectives right away. But then as a space elf player, like that doesn't really work for you. You you sort of can play Marines that way. That's one of the reasons that Marines are so good for new players is that they, that sort of intuitive way of playing the game is kind of what Marines are designed for. But Eldar are more complicated. If, if you just move uh, all of your, your fragile infantry and your only modestly durable tanks onto objectives in the first turn of the game, well... Uh, that's going to end up with your Autark weeping salty, salty tears over a bunch of dead space elves turn two while your Farseer yells, I foretold you so, as she disappears under a horde of greenskins. Uh, you might, doing that, score one or more midfield objectives turn two with the handful of remaining models that survive the purge, uh, but generally that game is as good as lost. So don't step one, don't do that. Eldari do have a few units that are viable for controlling midfield objectives in the early game, and you're going to need some of these. I'm going to talk about this later. Units that are good even against volume of fire, either because they're very durable or because they have lone operatives, so they're not targetable. Uh, but those units are not, they're not your single wound infantry and your toughness nine grav tanks. The tanks can do okay as early objective holders and matchups against armies without much shooting, like custodies or perhaps orcs uh, but in general you need to play conservatively with most of your models in the first two to three turns while you destroy most of your opponents essential units that's the that's the overall framework we're operating inside of and this brings us to perhaps the biggest single advantage that Eldari enjoy which is superior hard target elimination simply put Eldar have some of the best shooting in the game, especially against durable targets. In part, this is because of a detachment ability that can almost double the effectiveness of low rate of fire, high damage weapons. So the battle host detachment ability. If you're a totally new player to 40k, uh, you, your faction has some overall ability for Eldar, it's fate dice, right? You can read about that in the index. And then in addition to the overall ability that your faction gets, you choose, if you have a codex, one of six detachments, and then all your units in your army are just automatically in that detachment and get some bonus. It also determines what stratagems and enhancements you have access to. Or if like Eldar currently, there's only one default detachment available to you, uh, then you get the you get the enhancements and stratagems associated with that detachment. And the current detachment that exists for Aldari, the battle host, lets every unit in the army reroll one hit roll and one wound roll every time it shoots and every time it fights. That's fabulous. But it's especially fabulous for low rate of fire, high damage weapons for the obvious reason that those weapons are pointed in such a way that if you're rerolling like, so if you have a, a bright lance that's strength 12, right? But only one shot and minus three AP and D6 plus two damage. The points for the bright lance are, are all into that one shot. So if you can reroll that one die, it's a little bit like being able to reroll all of your dice with uh, some similarly pointed 
weapon with a higher rate of fire but lower strength. It's it's really good. Uh, this means that our bright lances, our D cannons, our prism cannons are significantly more effective than similar weapons possessed by other factions because in some cases in many cases they essentially have full rerolls to hit and wound in addition the ability to use fate dice in combination with a nearby farseer to guarantee that weapons either do their maximum possible damage or so a bright lance can automatically do eight damage or to trigger devastating wounds to completely bypass saving throws or to just automatically hit with Overwatch fire with like the Avatar of Kane's Wailing Doom, uh, which has insane strength and armor penetration and damage, and then still have, so you automatically hit, you still have your detachment reroll to wound. Uh, that just makes Eldari shooting terrifying, the terror of the table. Uh, Fate Dice plus the... Fate dice plus that detachment ability, that, that's that's one of the best shooting combos in the game. Uh, if you can leverage those advantages to remove some of your opponent's most essential units in the first two turns without comparative losses, then you really can't afford to get aggressive later, and it's very hard for your opponent to come back from that while you mop up what remains of her army and you, you max out your score for both primary and secondary objectives. So in general, that's what we're looking to do as Eldar players. We're leveraging our shooting for a come from behind victory after we've taken away our opponent's essential toys without taking away, without taking comparative losses. So let's talk, let's talk list building and how you go about affecting that. In, oh, in, in general, uh, if, if you were, if you were checking out for a moment there, now's a moment to tune, to tune back in because here's another essential principle. Uh, in general, effective Eldari armies that make it to, say, the podium at a grand tournament consist of the following. First of all, they have a Farseer and an Autark Wayleaper. The Farseer lets you use your fate dice effectively because units nearby the Farseer can treat uh, once per player turn any fate die roll as a six. And then... In the way the fate again, if you're really new, maybe you don't know what fate dice do. You roll six dice before the game begins, and you set them over to the side of the board. And before you roll a die, you can substitute one of those six dice for a hit roll, a wound roll, a damage roll, an armor save, an advance roll. It's it's a very useful, very powerful ability. And there's some ways to get other fate dice, but in in general, when I talk about fate dice, that's what I'm talking about. So, uh, a really competitive Eldari army will have a Farseer and a Wayleaper, definitely, I think, in the in the character slots almost all the time. The, the Farseer lets you use the Fate Dice effectively, and then the Autark Wayleaper gives you an extra command point. And Eldar have really good stratagems, so they're sort of CP hungry. The Autark Wayleaper is also a lone operative, so easy to keep alive and good for objective control in your backfield. I have a whole unit focus video on how to use the Way Leaper effectively. If you are interested in playing Eldar, I think this channel will be very useful to you. I'm not in this video going to go into great depth about how any individual unit plays, but most of the units that I that I talk about either already have a unit focus video for 10th edition in the earlier videos on this channel, or if you watch those videos, you will see them referred to as a, com a comparative unit. Um, so I think I've talked about all of these units I'm going to name in in those earlier videos. So you need the Farseer, uh, probably a foot Farseer, but not necessarily, and an Autark Wayleaper. And then you need one deadly and durable bully unit, generally. Uh, now, currently, there are, are only two top-tier durable bully units. The Avatar of Cain, which is hits fabulously hard and is very difficult to eliminate with its high toughness two up save and the fact that it halves incoming damage and if you throw fortune on it with a farseer it becomes which makes it minus one to wound it becomes very very difficult to eliminate uh or a block of 10 wraith guard with a spirit seer and then you throw fortune on those and those have a two up save and high toughness and the spirit seer can resurrect one every one of your turns at their wraith cannons you take the ones with the wraith cannons uh, have excellent hard target elimination. So these these durable bully units both force your opponent to make room for you in the midfield and makes it difficult for your opponent to get units close enough to your powerful shooting units to really threaten them uh, while also letting you score some early game points for objective control uh, where you otherwise might have found that difficult. 
in addition, most lists that make it to the podium at a GT have around six units, aside from the Avatar or the Wraith Guard, dedicated to hard target elimination. So this could be Fire Prisms, uh, D Cannon platforms are very popular right now in the new Necron meta, uh, Falcons with uh, Fire Dragons inside of them, Fugan is the only truly good Phoenix Lord. There are other slightly outsider picks. Uh, a Warwalker with two Bright Lances is is a very good hard target elimination unit. You you need about six of those on top of your your dangerous bullet unit, and th and that's enough firepower to eliminate probably most of your opponent's most threatening units. So, in addition to the the two characters, the durable bullet unit, the six hard target elimination units. You probably also need three to five units de dedicated to scoring that can also multi-class into infantry elimination. These are units that are relatively cheap, so they're sacrificial and very, very fast, so they can get where they need to be for scoring purposes. So generally matched play, more competitive 40K, is played with uh, the Leviathan mission deck. You can, half your points in the game are scored for primary objective control, controlling objectives on the table, and then the other half for doing stuff. Usually this means either spreading out your units into different quadrants of the table or sometimes uh, jumping on objectives with units that might end up being sort of sacrificial. There are a variety of things, and I, probably most of the people listening to this video already know the basics of that, but you need units that are fast and somewhat disposable to max out primary uh or excuse me, secondary scoring, and Eldar can do that. So we're thinking of units like Swooping Hawks. Warp Spiders are a little expensive, but they're so fast that having at least one unit of Warp Spiders is really good. Those are the two standard ones that appear most often, but um, also Shadow Specters, uh, Vipers, the the Singleton Jet Bikes, small units of Wind Riders, the least popular choice for this, but they, but they work. Uh, similarly, Shroud Runners can work. Um, Harlequin Sky Weavers, they're, they're not all equally competitive, but those units are cheap enough and fast enough that they perform well in this role. And pretty much all of those, not the Vipers, uh, but all of the rest of those are also pretty good at just killing light infantry. A lot of those other units we considered uh, earlier, the Fire Dragons and War Walkers with two Bright Lances and D Cannons, they don't they don't excel at killing light infantry. Fire prisms can be pretty good at it, but so you, you also need the ability to pick up hordes and generally your scoring units are going to be the units you use for that. So if you're building an Eldari list, you can start by buying a Farseer and a Wayleaper. You're going to need them. And then you choose either 10 Wraith Guard with a Spirit Seer or the Avatar of Cain. And then you're going to need about six killer units and uh three to five fast scoring units i'll talk a little bit more about uh the relative value of of some of those but that's it, it can you build a list that isn't exactly like that and have and do well with it yes but the vast majority of eldari lists that are doing well in competitive play are working on that general framework and so if you're a new player looking for a general framework to work from that's probably where you you want to be after you build that initial list, you need to revise it and fine tune it by making sure that it has answers to all of the obstacles it may encounter. And this is true no, no matter what army you play. This is what you want to do. You, you start with your list and then you ask yourself, how will my list eliminate hard targets like tanks and monsters, including doing so at very long range? As an elder player, you want to be able to pick up some of your opponents, at least one of your opponents, most essential hard target units first turn of the game at a range of like 36 inches uh so that's a that's a factor your fire dragons are great but they they have limited range they're not they're not usually turn one great unless you're the second player on turn one and, and, and it's not can can you can you run a list successfully that is mo more short range target limb yes but in general you want some of your hard target limb to be sufficiently long range that you can pick something up turn one not all of those six units have to do that but some of them should how is your list going to eliminate heavy infantry like space marines if you come up against a list uh there was a 
an archetype before the recent balanced data slate, a chaos Marine archetype that ran like 52 wound infantry with a three up save uh, T4. Well, how are you going to deal with that? Do you have your bright lances are not going to be super efficient into that. Do you, do you have a way to handle heavy infantry? How are you going to score primary objectives? Right? So, uh, in the late game, you're going to score primary objectives by having killed most of your opponent's stuff and then having units that are fast and a bit durable, like T9 tanks that can jump on them. But how are you going to score enough points on turns two and three that you can still pretty much max out your score for primary objectives? Well, uh, the bullet unit like the Avatar of Kane, and then lone operative units that are not targetable but fast enough to get onto objectives. The Autark Wayleaper can do that. Uh, Solitaire can do that. The Death Jester with Fate's Messenger uh, can do that. Illic Night Spear can do that. All of these are potentially options. Uh, you should have at least one lone operative in, in your list. Two is better, but um, one is one is good. Um, and then how are you going to score secondary objectives? And again, the secondary scoring, mostly that's going to happen as the result of those fast units I mentioned earlier, your warp spiders, your swooping hawks, but you should have a plan. You should be able to look through the Leviathan mission deck and ask yourself, well, if I get this, this pair of missions on turn one, what would I do? And you can afford in a game of 40 K to throw away one or two secondary missions in the course of the game without scoring them and still max out your score for secondaries, but you can't be doing it a lot. So you've, you've got to be prepared to work with most combinations of secondaries that you would get even in the uh, first couple turns of the game, which is why, again, why warp spiders are so popular because they have an ability that lets them be absurdly fast on turn one if you need to score by, say, being in your opponent's backfield on the first turn of the game. Now, some units uh, also multi-class effectively into multiple of these jobs, making them some of the more popular units. I mentioned fire prisms earlier. Fire prisms are very good at hard target elimination. They're very good at killing heavy infantry, and they're pretty good at killing light infantry. So they're just good at they're just good at killing. Shadow specters are good because uh, they're. They have minus two AP, they can do flat two damage, or they can do a ton of shots to models with only one wound. They're only 95 points, so they're cheaper than warp spiders, a little more than swooping hawks, but they're fast. They're very, very fast. So they're both a unit that's good at target elimination, and they're a unit that can score you secondaries, and they're cheap enough that you can lose them to score a secondary, and they can make a move after they shoot, so they can stay alive to both score and participate in the battle. Fugan uh, is a Phoenix Lord who not only makes your fire dragons better, but has really good hard target elimination and has a five out of six chance of just standing up when he dies, which makes him very good at scoring some clutch primary objective because your opponent just can't shoot him off of it. They they shoot him dead. He stands up and he still scores it for you. Similarly, the Death Jester is really good at killing heavy infantry. If you give it Fate's Messenger, I have a whole video about it, but because it has lone operative, it can also stand on an objective on your side of the table and simply be untargetable and score that for you. Other tools that can be really useful uh, in getting the job done include units that can infiltrate so can be deployed anywhere on the table at the beginning of the game, nine inches away from your opponent's deployment zone and enemy models. Infiltrators are good for two reasons. One, they let you screen out your opponent's infiltrators. In order to play Eldar effectively, you need to not get overrun in melee by your opponent's army. So being able to deploy such that your opponent can't deploy infiltrators nine inches from your uh, backfield and get in there on turn one, um, can be good. You don't absolutely need the way the meta is working these days. You don't, it's not essential that you have a unit of say rangers or scorpions, but they're, they're good. Uh, they're a little out of fashion at the moment, but it's not, a, it's, it's not a bad thing to include your, in your list. The other thing infiltrators do for you is they help you score secondaries on the first turn of the game by, by being in places in the board that might otherwise be hard to reach. Rangers are a cheaper option. Uh, at 55 points, it doesn't really matter if they die. I think they're still 55. Scorpions uh, might actually kill some stuff if they get into melee, and they're a little bit more durable with their three-up armor save, but um, they're a little bit more expensive. Either either is a viable pick. Uh, vipers, I mentioned that Vipers are quick enough to score secondaries for you. They also have a very 
powerful ability. If, if a Viper shoots something, and generally you want to give a Viper a Bright Lance, uh, you can choose to strip that thing of its cover save. So this basically gives all of the other weapons in your army that shoot that target an additional AP if the thing was in, tar if the thing was in cover. And if it's a high value target, it's likely to be. And Bright Lances only have minus three AP instead of minus four. So if something's got a three up save or even a two up save initially and it's in cover, which is reducing the AP, uh, it's really good to have a Viper so or, or two Vipers. So this is another tool that's pretty useful. Uh, I like the scout move on, on War Walkers can run out into the middle of the table. I mentioned that a War Walker with twin Bright Lances is a solid include for one of your about six hard target elimination units. It's also, I have a, I have a video about War Walkers. They're very durable for their points. And they let you pull this trick early in the game where you use a fate die to, to automatically hit with Overwatch. Uh, on turn one, the War Walker can position itself such that it will probably have a turn one target for the trick where you use a fate die to automatically hit with a bright lance and then have a reroll to wound on Overwatch. Uh, Night Spinners are an indirect fire tank. They're pretty expensive at 210 points, but they allow you, they don't have any AP, but they have a high volume of shots and they have devastating wounds so they can push through some wounds on anything in your in your opponent's army that are unpreventable with flat two damage and they reduce opponent's movement and also their charges or advance rolls. so having a night spinner to control opponent's movement to prevent them from getting where they need to get to to score or setting up charges can be very effective uh another useful sort of multi-classing tool some of the harlequin units you can take if you have uh, 55 60 points left over you can take a troop master which is this singleton character that can run around and just sort of jump on objectives, be cheap and disposable, be a problem for your opponent. Use the grenade stratagem. If the, a troop, if if you get to the end of list building for Eldar and you've got like a few points left that you can't quite use, putting a troop master in is is a is a, is a popular pick. The solitaire is uh, I mentioned a, a lone operative. It also has a blitz move that's just really good for picking up enemy infantry. Um, so if you don't have enough ways to kill infantry, you, you probably do, but if you don't, a solitaire can be, uh, a reasonable pick. So take the characters that you need, the, the Farseer and the Wayleaper, pick your, pick your durable bully unit, pick your six target eliminations, pick your scoring units. Maybe you want to dip into some of these other useful tools as you customize your list. Here are some units that you should avoid in competitive play. Or if you're deciding what to buy and you want to make sure that you, you have a viable list for your local game store, here are things I do not recommend. Wraith Lords. Uh, their ballistic skill and weapon skill of four, um, given their, their point cost, is kind of a deal breaker. They're not, they're not competitive um, at the moment. Warlock Conclaves, particularly the Bike Conclaves, a couple of foot... Warlocks can be okay as ablative wounds for a Farseer. You only really need that if there's a big indirect fire meta, which isn't really a thing right now, but the bike conclaves are not good. Um, if you're going to take Guardians, you really don't need more than a single squad. Uh, Guardian Defenders can help generate command points by sitting on a backfield objective. They can be modestly, weirdly durable in cover, um, which is neat. Uh in the storm guardians with their fusion guns are like okay but you d don't take a ton of guardians if you're doing a, an ulthway theme list and you must do that to make your dream work then yes and at some point i'll make a video about how to play a thematic ulthway list but in general more than one unit of guardians guardians are kind of a zero to one thing don't 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 take a ton of them um shining spears not good right now they uh a, a squad of shining spears is too expensive for its damage output it just doesn't doesn't really get the job done and then they are less durable than a squad of five space marines yeah they've got a five up in volman but they're they're toughness for two wound models that um die quite easily uh and are a little bit too expensive to be a trading unit the corsair void scarred are beautiful models really cool loadouts neat nuanced finicky niche play um they're wildly overcosted for what they can do on the the table uh, the, the basic Corsairs are theoretically useful, but 
Um, if you're going to take them, you might as well just take Banshees instead generally. But the the Void Scarred are overpriced. Uh, the Phoenix Lords that are not Fugan or maybe Karen Dross are generally traps. There's a one very skilled player in the UK who's getting a little bit of play out of Jane Czar. But in general, if you're a newer player, new to Eldar, if, you, if you're going to take a Phoenix Lord, you take Fugan, maybe Karen Dross. But the Phoenix Lords are not currently where it is at, as we say in the States. Uh, Dire Avengers, they're just not that great. Honestly, I think a unit of Guardians is probably better. Uh, they just can't get there with their damage output, and they have the same armor save as Guardians. Um, the Autark Skyrunner doesn't doesn't do it at the moment. Doesn't get the job, just doesn't. There's no role. There's no role for the Autark Skyrunner. Uh, the aircraft, aircraft in 40K generally right now are struggling Um Especially the Hemlock Wraith Fighter, you can you can sort of use, uh, you you can kind of make a Crimson Hunter work or a pair of them as like an Alpha Strike unit. I I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, the Hemlock is is really really not worth the points. Prince Uriel, uh, he's a narrative include only, um, and the Webway Gate is probably the worst unit in the whole game. It the cost is just laughably absurd and it doesn't really do anything for you uh there are a bunch of units i didn't talk about at all if i didn't talk about the unit at all i then what i think about it is that it does probably have play in the right list especially in the hands of a uh, skilled player banshees are an example of this there are a couple players over in the uk who've done really well at gts with some units of banshees they're actually weirdly really good into Necrons. They do in certain metas. They do have a role if they come out of a Falcon and they're used in a very particular way. But uh, generally speaking, the units that I mentioned as the probable includes for each of the roles above those, I think, are the the go to competitive units. And then the units I just suggested avoiding those are not the ones to buy initially, unless you just love the model and you want to play it, or you're including it for narrative reasons or or, or whatever. And the others are kind of like maybes but probably more challenging to use if i haven't addressed them uh in the video okay let's talk stratagems so one of the the challenges with learning a new army is just keeping track of all of the tools available to you and remembering what your units can do and not forgetting to use your stratagems or not using your cp poorly on uh stratagems that really aren't optimal so i'll go through the the six stratagems and suggest the ones that I think you should have ready to go in the hopper and then the ones that are more situational and, and a couple of the sort of general game stratagems that are also relevant. So the best stratagems for an Eldari player, I think, uh, in most lists, lightning fast reactions, you just pick a unit that's not a Wraith Construct and you make it minus one to hit, you, you'll use that one a ton. It's so good. It's fabulous on the Avatar of Kane for making the Avatar extra durable, but other units too. Oftentimes it's the difference between something surviving a turn and something not surviving a turn. That's one CP. Uh, Fire and Fade is a two CP stratagem that lets you move after shooting. It's incredibly powerful and frankly necessary if you're running a pair of fire prisms and you only ever run fire prism, prisms in pairs, but it also can help you keep an essential unit alive or get onto an objective when you really need to. It's two CP, so it's quite expensive. If you're going to ever use it at all, you must have an Autark Wayleaper that generates an extra CP, but it is, even at two CP, it's a very powerful tool to have available. Overwatch, this is a generic stratagem that anybody can use but the ability to automatically hit with your fate dice with an incredibly hard hitting weapon like the Avatar's Wailing Doom or a Bright Lance and then still reroll the wound roll because you have the detachment ability. Well, that's just crazy good. Eldari have some of the best Overwatch in the game. The grenade stratagem, if you're not using the grenade stratagem, it's like, it's so good. You just, you get a unit that has this grenade strat stratagem near something else and, and you roll six dice at the beginning of the shooting phase when you trigger it and do a bunch of mortal wounds to something you can do this with your troop masters you can do this with your uh if you run any you can do this with your way leaper you'll definitely run one of those fire dragons have the grenade stratagem right so it's just it's a good thing to be aware of it's a powerful tool vehicle shock where you drive your vehicle into something and do a bunch of mortal wounds uh that can be a good one especially in the late game when you don't have as much left but your your fire prisms or your night spinner or whatever have come out from total safety to start getting 
jiggy on the table, just driving into something and then doing a bunch of mortal wounds for a CP can be totally worth it. Uh, especially because big guns never tire, lets tanks shoot even if they're in melee, although there is a penalty to hit. So if, you, if you're new to Eldar and you are trying to remember what you can do and you're, you've got the cards and you're laying them out on, a, on the table, I would definitely lay out like lightning fast reactions as a go-to and then maybe these other ones too. You might not have anything in your army that you're going to, I don't know, vehicle shock with or something, but um, those are the ones to be a, a, a aware of. The two more situational ones that are nevertheless very, very good, but they're more situational are Feigned Retreat and Phantasm. Phantasm started out as arguably maybe the best stratagem in the whole game. Um, but it's been nerfed twice, and now uh, it can only be used on infantry units, and when you use it at the end of your opponent's movement phase, they only they move D6, so there's a chance they don't get where they need to go. With a singleton character model, especially that has lone operative, like a Wayleaper, this can still be really good, or something that needs to duck out of line of sight, like Eldred. Uh, one inch, even if you roll a one, is is probably enough. But but phantasm is now a highly situational stratagem. It's no longer a go to. Feigned retreat. Obviously, if you get caught up in melee with something that doesn't want to be in melee, the ability to fall back and still shoot and charge is great. Uh, a couple other highly situational ones: matchless agility and blade storm. Matchless agility lets you max out an advance roll, which you can also do with fate dice, which is if you're going to do it, usually how you're going to do it. But there might be moments where you need for scoring purposes. It's good to remember that it exists so that you can score an objective or get into some quadrant of the table. Blade storm gives better AP on uh, criticals, significantly better AP, but only on, only on criticals. And you have to have pretty high volume of fire for it to be worthwhile. But if you are using a bunch of scatter lasers or uh, mast, even something like um, volume of fire from your uh, shadow specters or your swooping hawks when you really need it in, in the late game, sometimes it can make sense to push through some wounds with blade storm. But you're going to know whether or not your list calls for it. Uh, you probably will spend most of your CP on lightning fast if you're running fired prisms, fire and fade, um, and like one other stratagem. You shouldn't generally be using a lot of command rerolls. It, it, it does occasionally make sense to use a command reroll when something, some big like scoring shift is riding on it. Like if you were to succeed, you would get five points and your opponent loses five points. Then yeah, you reroll a die looking for a six or maybe you reroll a damage roll because you already blew your fate die this round. Like every now and then, it absolutely makes sense to do a CP reroll. But often new players will use most of their command points on CP rerolls, and you really should be using fewer CP rerolls probably than than other stratagems by a somewhat significant margin. In in most games, there are exceptions to just about every roll, except the webway gate. Oh, uh, and enhancements. I'll briefly talk about each of the four enhancements and which ones I think you should prioritize. Uh, none of the enhancements, none of the four enhancements are absolute must-have auto-includes in every list, but two of them are very good and two of them are situationally pretty good. Uh, my favorite one is the Phoenix Gem. You can give it to any non-named HQ character, just Eldari model, only when the bearer dies on a 2+, plus at the end of the phase, it stands back up. Uh, this is particularly good on either your Farseer or I, I like it on Wayleapers because Wayleapers have lone operative and they, they can therefore control objectives. But if something goes wrong and your opponent gets close enough to kill your Wayleaper, you can just get your Wayleaper back up and it really it really helps you control those midfield objectives when you need to do some clutch scoring. Although 25 is a little bit steep. Fate's Messenger for 15 points once per turn lets you reroll either a hit roll, wound roll, or saving throw for the bearer. You can treat it as uh, an unmodified roll of six. Now, this means that on your turn, theoretically, you could automatically trigger uh, lethal hits or sustained hits. This is an absolute must have on a death jester. If you take the death jester, you must give its fate's messenger. But it's pretty good on something like uh, a wayleaper with a fusion gun. 
I also really like that you can change the outcome of the die after you have rolled. That's really powerful. Uh, it also means that on your opponent's turn, one of your character models, a, the fusion gun on the Wayleaper is fabulous, can automatically hit on Overwatch. Uh, or if you're not close enough, the ability to automatically pass a invulnerable saving throw is also really good. At 15 points, I think it's pretty competitive. The other two enhancements help you generate uh, command points. I'm sorry, um, fate dice or manipulate fate dice. For 15 points, the weeping stones give you an additional uh, fate die every time the bearer's unit destroys an enemy unit. I'm not super crazy about this one. There's, We don't have a killy enough, because you can't give it to the avatar of Cain. We don't have a killy enough HQ option that there's like an obvious pick for this. But sometimes people do give it to a spirit seer running around with a bunch of wraith guard. Um, I think the only reason I don't is in that situation, I like for my spirit seer to have the phoenix gem so it doesn't get assassinated by something with precision. And then reader of runes, uh, in your command phase, you give it to a psyker model, lets you re-roll one of your fate dice. It's 20 points. Uh, I'm going to say you should only take reader of runes if you also have a way in your list to get more fate dice. Because if you're starting the game with only six fate dice and you have a farseer uh, who can treat let units treat any of those fate dice as rolls of six, you don't need to also be able to re-roll the fate dice. But if you have Eldred who lets you start the game with nine fate dice, Eldred's very good, but he's not an auto include by a long shot. Um, then you might think about this, or maybe if you have uh, guardian defenders that if they sit on an objective they generate more fate dice like maybe but for my money um the phoenix gem is probably the best one closely followed by fate's messenger i also think for newer players the phoenix gem is just the most straightforward easiest to use okay uh one last tip before i wrap this up i mentioned early in the video that Eldar play by generally relying on the late game for scoring and focusing on target elimination in the first two turns. And so then there's the question of target priority. Generally, as an Eldari player, you need to prioritize, you, you prioritize the greatest threats, right? And as an Eldari player, those are going to be your opponent's units that are fast and the units that have the damage and AP to be a threat to like the Avatar of Cain or, or your Wraith guard if that's your bully unit or even your your grav tanks so that you can later get more aggressive with those units but generally the fast units have to go first because eldari rely on being faster than the opponent not being not giving your opponent the the beads of line of sight that they would need to pick up your fragile space selves and being able to like outmaneuver your opponent on the table so if your opponent has a couple of squads of fast bikes you kill those first and then you prioritize the heavy weapons that can take out uh, your, your own durable stuff. And obviously, generally, you want to destroy the heavy weapons that are easiest to kill first. So if you're choosing between a tank and a heavy weapons team, uh, and you, you know there's a 100% chance you kill the heavy weapons team and like a 75% chance you kill the tank, obviously, you, you kill the heavy weapons team first. All right. And... Uh, to wrap up, my last suggestion, and this isn't just a suggestion for playing Eldar, this is a suggestion for anybody who's moving into either a new faction or or even a new play style or even making a very different list with a faction that they are familiar with, and that is to make a battle plan. And by battle plan, I mean like you legit open a document on your computer and you make the plan. Uh, you, you say like on turn one, depending on what the board looks like, but you no know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, but you, you have a plan. Uh, on turn one, these units, these durable units will move toward midfield objectives. These shooting units, you'll say to yourself, like my fire prism will pop out. Both prisms will shoot from the perspective of the one fire prism and they will attempt to destroy one of my opponent's fast units or something that's hard hitting. Uh, you remind yourself like on turn one, I'm going to have two CP from my way leaper. I'm going to use those on fire and fade. And then on my opponent's turn, I'm going to use one CP on lightning fast. And you, you make a, you make a plan on turn one. I'm going to do this on turn two. I'm going to do this. And you write down my general strategy will be this. And you, you make notes to yourself on stuff that you don't want to forget. Like, so if you listen to me say that thing about grenades and you thought, Oh yeah, I should be using the grenade strat right down. Like 
don't forget to use grenade stratagem and write down what it does. And you might be thinking to yourself, Brent, I could just look at the, I literally bring a list of all the stratagems with me to my games. I put it next to the board. I could just look at it. I don't need to write down what it does. I have it. And I say to you, dear aspiring autark, the point is not that you don't have the information elsewhere. The point is that if you go through the the experience of having to write the thing down, it will be in your head. You're, you're much more likely to remember it at the table. I find battle plans so useful. I've been playing Warhammer for years and years. And if I'm, if I'm switching to even a new just a new archetype of list that plays differently for a faction that I'm already pretty familiar with. I, I still make battle plans. And so that's what I've got. Eldari are a highly customizable, very flexible, really fun army to play that can be extremely competitive in 10th edition 40 K, even after two rounds of nerfs, they're still a very good faction. Uh, They're also extremely unforgiving at times for newer players or if you make mistakes although that said i think they're less unforgiving in this edition than they've been in quite some time because of the detachment re-rolls and because the durability of some of the central units but it's still pretty easy to make a mistake as an eldar player and then find it difficult to bounce back so it may take some practice uh and i would encourage you also to play if you have a list that seems like it should be able to do all of the things, play with it two or three times. Don't don't like change your list and decide something is terrible the first time it doesn't work for you. Play with it two or three times uh, to to work through right the the tactics before you make big changes to it. And uh, even though I didn't talk much about the how to play individual units in this video. As I said earlier, there are unit focus videos for a lot of individual units, and there's also uh, an index review. When 10th edition dropped, I did an index review of every unit in the index, and most of the most of that information is still reasonably current and somewhat valuable. We didn't we didn't know as much when, when the, like a week after the index dropped, I think I put the video out like days after the index dropped, uh, the videos, we didn't know as much as we do now in terms of the meta and how 10th edition was different from ninth. But a lot of that, a lot of that information will still be valuable. So there it is. Uh, if you are a veteran player listening to this video and you have your own ideas that you think would be useful as general principles for new players, please leave those in the comments below. If you want to say hi, uh, I always like it when people say hi and it helps the algorithm. And if you want to leave a comment just to help the algorithm, that's helpful too. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, I'm really excited to play Eldari. This is, this, this video was so, it was so useful. I could become a patron and connect with Brent more personally and also talk to his community of patrons on his Discord and obtain early access to content and also benefit from other advantages. You could follow the link in the video description and become a patron of the arts, the Eldari arts, which I hugely appreciate. Okay, thanks everybody. Back again soon with something new. Until then. Best of luck with your pointy ears.